Hey guys, I'm back with another video. It seemed like you guys really liked the previous useless runescape information video that I did a while back, and honestly it was kind of fun searching around the internet and in game for little useless things about the game, so I figured I'd make another one. So here is 19 more minutes of useless runescape information. I hope you guys enjoy. So, starting off the video, I've got something that is truly useless to know, but I think it's very interesting. I never knew this before, but it was once possible in the earliest days of RuneScape Classic to obtain 5 extra inventory spaces, on top of the already 30 inventory spaces that the player would possess. Before pay to play became Jagex's primary monetization strategy on the 27th of February in 2002, Jagex relied on revenue from advertisements in order to support development and server hosting costs for RuneScape and other Jagex related products. RuneScape before 2002 had been operating at a small loss, but because of the rate of RuneScape's growth being enormous, the loss was actually growing. Because of this, Jagex had resorted to directly asking players who had been online for more than one hour to click advertisements to increase revenue. They would do this in the form of an in-game advertisement on the player's client. On the old RuneScape Tippet website, there was even a player who made a post on July 17, 2001, desperately imploring players to click on advertisements above and below the RuneScape client to help Andrew Gower earn more revenue, as he was getting close to having to shut down the game at the time due to the financial burden it was causing on his life to run it. So, how did the Gower brothers attempt to reconcile this before pay to play? Well, one option in which significant effort was invested was a partnership called Yoptin. Yoptin was a program by the company called Conso Data in the early 2000s which collected demographics and marketing related information via voluntary surveys that were placed on the websites of Yoptin's partners. Like other partners, Jagex would have collected its user base Yoptin's full array of demographics and indicated interests through an extensive survey. In return, Jagex would offer those who filled out the survey an incentive, 5 extra inventory spaces in-game. The survey was to be conducted in-game while you were logged into RuneScape Classic. There was going to be an incentives explanation screen, which would explain how the survey worked and what you would be rewarded for if you completed it, which I'm showing here. There was also a privacy statement screen, which was only available to be seen if players had clicked the View Yopton Privacy Statement button below the incentives page. You can pause the video and read everything that it entailed here. There was a demographic screen that followed the privacy statement, which was the main data collection area, and there were 13 sections to fill out, which you can also see here. After clicking Register Me on the Demographics page, the player would finally then be transported to the Interest screen, and they would determine whether or not they were interested in any of the list of 20 different categories. After clicking OK, as long as the player had indicated at least one interest, all the player's information would have been sent to Jagex so that it could be handed off to Yopton as a part of their partnership. The player would then return back to the main game and a message would likely appear, letting them know that their survey was received received, and they would have received an email with a code in which they could have used to activate their 5 bonus inventory spaces. Obviously, the 5 extra inventory spaces in RuneScape Classic was never a thing, so the partnership between Yopton and Jagex never saw the light of day. There are several possible reasons as to why this partnership never came to fruition though. The 5 inventory spaces buff, totaling 35 in all, might have been seen as too egregiously immoral to lock behind giving so much information to Yopton. There were no banks in RuneScape Classic during this time, and it would have been a clear advantage to players who had 35 inventory spaces instead of only 30. It could have been that, or it could have been that Yopton didn't offer Jagex enough money for the compromise and values to be worth it, or they simply didn't offer enough to save RuneScape as a whole. Other reasoning behind the partnership never happening may have been that the pay-to-play membership model, though unreleased, was being thought of, and perhaps the Gower brothers decided amongst themselves that that would have been the better route to take for the game's future. Or it could have been that Yopton themselves declined the entire partnership, which could have been due to the young average age of RuneScape's player base at the time, being mostly unsuitable to market towards. 
as most surveying companies require you to be at least 18 years or older. In any case, there was very little impact on RuneScape as a result of the failed partnership between Yopton and Jagex. All code directly related to Yopton and their in-game survey screens was completely removed from the RuneScape Classic client sometime between August and November of 2001. However, internal handling of the inventory still supported a possible upper limit of 35 items stored, as you can see within this screenshot here. This relic of the failed partnership would have survived though for some players, sort of like rare items did, and some players probably would have kept their 5 extra inventory spaces up until RuneScape Classic closed in August of 2018. Within the Falador party room, you can go downstairs and find the Old School RuneScape Museum. It's filled with stuff about the game's history, and more and more stuff gets added each year for Old School RuneScape's birthday events. Something I never noticed though, was that the braziers down there actually show the rune symbols in the fires, just like the login screen braziers show the in-game rune symbols too. Upstairs on the second floor of Karen Castle, you can find an NPC named Knight of Varlamor, and his name is Astra. His appearance, name, and some of his dialogue is a reference to the character within the Dark Souls series called Solaire of Astora. Within the game, Solaire is an iconic knight with a noble mission and an unwavering sense of optimism in an otherwise dreary and fatalistic game world within Dark Souls. So, within RuneScape 3, a lot of the objects within the game have been heavily reworked with the rest of the game's graphics, but there are some objects within certain instances that revert back to their original models from their upgraded ones before the game was ever made into what it is today. An example of this would be the Lady Lumbridge ship that's used within the Dragon Slayer quest. In Port Sarum's shipping port, you can see that the ship has been upgraded to look more like an actual ship, but during the cutscenes of the quest when you sail to Crandor and find the dragon Elvarg, you can see that the ship in the cutscene is actually the original ship model from RuneScape 2. And it is also the original ship model when you crash land on the island. Also, something I thought was weird was, look at the captain's wheel. There is absolutely no space between the captain's wheel and the mast behind it. It's honestly no wonder we crashed. Within the Guardians of the Rift minigame, you can find some objects around the map that heavily reference SpongeBob SquarePants. You can find SpongeBob's Pineapple House, Squidward's Easter Island Head, and Batrick's Rock House. What's also interesting is that within the old school RuneScape's cache files, you can find a colorized, more detailed version of SpongeBob's Pineapple House. Perhaps Jagex just made it blue in the live game instead, along with Patrick and Squidward's houses for legal reasons. Also, within the cache files of unused things, you can find an item called a Runes Cape, and it looks pretty cool. A Jagex moderator even showed this cape off a long time ago to the public, but I don't think many ever really got a good look at it. Interestingly enough, RuneScape 3 and Old School RuneScape both have a model of this cape. I wonder why Jagex has never released it to the players in both game versions. In RuneScape 3, all the gods have actually returned to RuneScape within the lore of the game, and they all have their own models. For some reason, Jagex spent a significant amount of time on Zamorak's mouth. He has a full set of teeth, gums, and a tongue. And, uh, I bet his mouth smells pretty evil too by the looks of it. So, a lot of early veterans of RuneScape might remember this one. This is truly useless, but I thought it was cool as a kid when I figured it out. I felt like a real hacker man even though I was simply doing nothing important. So, in RuneScape Classic, you can change the color of your text by typing an at sign and then the first three letters of the color you want to type in, and then by typing another at sign after your first three letters of your chosen color. Afterwards, you just type your message and it would be in the color that you chose. There's a whole list of colors that could have been used in RuneScape Classic at this time. My favorite one, however, and seizure warning, by the way, was when you would type at ran for random, and then another at sign. Your text would change colors extremely quickly afterwards. 
When RuneScape 2 came out, the list of RuneScape Classic chat colors was done away with in-game, and the new ones that we have today were put in place. However, from 2004 to 2006, on the login screen, you could still use the original list of RuneScape Classic chat colors to change the color of the text that you entered on the username and password area. In an unknown update in 2007, being able to do this was eventually removed from the game. In RuneScape Classic, for some reason, there's actually two Gertrude NPCs in Varrock. One can be found inside of her house, while the other one can be found in her garden in her backyard. This isn't the first time Jagex has done this either though. For example, the NBC Donnie that can be found near Lumbridge Castle Courtyard who helps out new players can also be found again near the furnace and the sheep pen north of the castle. For some reason, the Blood Rune within RuneScape Classic uses a different background stone template than all the other runes in that game version. So, when visiting the Grand Exchange, the song that you hear is called The Trade Parade. I imagine that most players of RuneScape will recognize this song and immediately think of the GE, but that's actually not where the song was meant to be played, and the Grand Exchange was also not why the song was even created in the first place. At some point in 2005, Jagex moderators Mod Vincent and Mod Greg began work on a minigame that was going to be called Kelda Grim Trading. Keldegrim Trading was an unreleased minigame that the two developed, and it was planned to be set amongst an area called the Trade Octagon, on the first floor of Keldegrim Palace. The minigame would have focused on merchanting, and involved speculating on the fluctuating prices of items sold by the Dwarven traders. With the release of Ratcatchers on the 28th of November in 2005, a minigame map icon was even accidentally added to the trade octagon in Keldegrim by mistake. And some players named Shadow589776 and Banana recorded this finding on a popular forum post within the Future Updates category in September of 2006. Implementation of the minigame didn't get past the prototype stage, however, with Mod Vincent stating that he wasn't able to get this activity to work after all, and he subsequently resigned from Jagex later during 2005 as well. Assets relating to the minigame would manage to find their way into the game a couple years later though, with the release of the actual Grand Exchange in 2007. When the song The Trade Parade was first created in 2005 for its original purpose, it sounded like this. After all the music tracks in the game were upgraded on March 6, 2007, then the song sounded like this. Eight months later, in November of 2007, the Grand Exchange was released and the Trade Parade was reworked to sound like this. It seems noteworthy to mention that there were also audio files found that were named Kelda Trade Win and Kelda Trade Lose. Here's what it would have sounded like if you had won the original minigame. And here's what it would have sounded like if you had lost the minigame. So, the guard NPCs in RuneScape have changed quite a bit over the years. When RuneScape 2 was officially released on the 29th of March in 2004, various city guards looked like this. As RuneScape 2 developed, their chain bodies were eventually graphically changed. 
Here's some guards around RuneScape that had their chain bodies changed on April 10th, 2006. I honestly think the older chain bodies from 2004 looked better. They looked like actual chain body armor compared to their upgraded versions, which look more like studs to me instead of chains. Possibly the most frequently upgraded guards in the game are the guards of the city of Verok. On the 29th of May 2007, when the city of Verok received its graphical rework, the guards were upgraded as well, and they looked like this. One interesting thing about this version of these guards is that their style and animations were actually copied from the Renegade Knights, which were the knights that imprisoned the Knights of the Round Table and Merlin during the quest King's Ransom. When RuneScape HD released in 2008, the Varrock guards were upgraded to look like this. And after the Evolution of Combat released in 2010 in RuneScape 3, Varrock guards received visible eyeballs on their models shown here. Then, in 2016, when Jagex upgraded a lot of RuneScape's game world with the release of their NXT client, which was done away with in 2019, the guards had their appearances changed once again to this. And in January of 2022, Verrock guards within RuneScape 3 once again were upgraded into how they look today at the time of this video shown here. And finally, within old school RuneScape, the Verrock guards were changed completely to have more old school styled armor on November 9th, 2022, just nine months ago. Here's what they look like now. This update was called Diversity and Inclusion Changes, and a lot of various guards now have females among their ranks as well. Speaking of NPC changes, a lot of NPCs have changed over the years. For example, Gertrude in Verrock used to be fat for some reason. The Verrock General Store Clerk now has a feather inside his apron that he didn't used to have. The Verrock Smithing Shop owner Horvick has blacksmith tools in his apron. Ajat in the Warriors Guild has spiked shoulder pads that you've probably never seen before because they're hidden by his attack skill cape shoulder pads. A lot of NPCs have glasses, yet glasses as an item doesn't exist in the game for players, which kind of really sucks. For example, the Examiner NPC at the Exam Center has glasses, Dr. Harlow in the Blue Moon Inn has glasses, the Master Crafter in the Crafting Guild has glasses, Grum in Port Serum's Jewelry Store has purple glasses, the Sinister Stranger Vampire dude that you compete against during the Fishing Contest quest has super cool Deal With It sunglasses, which I really want, and the annoying kids in Varrock have ties on their shirts. But we don't get ties either, do we? Patterns are becoming clear, you understand. Pause. Editing moat blocks here. Uh, turns out, we can have glasses. They're actually rewards from Clue Scrolls. You can get a monocle, sagacious specs, party hat and specs, and half moon glasses. I take back everything I just said in the last two minutes. I look awesome. They're still not exactly the deal with it sunglasses, though. We've got a lot of useless information topics about Verrock in this video, don't we? Well, here's another one. In the Verrock Sword Shop, you can find popular British-American rapper and record producer MF Doom's poster in their store on the wall. In the Drill Demon Random Event, you're enclosed within a space in which you must do specific exercises to complete the event, but there's actually a lot of stuff around the military-style base that you can't ever get to or even see, especially if you did this event back in the old days with the game's limited view range on draw distance. Around the area where you do the exercises, there is an obstacle course surrounding you. To the northwest, there's actually three barracks that are fully furnished inside that the player would usually never be able to see. The wardrobes inside used next to the bunk beds are the same wardrobes that can be found inside Drainer Manor. A little south of the barracks are catapults as well, and to the northeast, there is an infirmary filled with medical beds and blood on the floor that the player would also never be able to see normally. And here, of some of these objects that I spoke about, you can see the examine information for some of the objects and furnishings too. It's cool that Jagex went the extra mile for the area of this random event back when it released in 2005. And lastly, near the edge of the wilderness, you can come across certain signs that, when examined, say, watch out for the beast. A lot of people most likely recognize these signs, as most people examined them when they were kids playing the game. If you've ever wondered which beast the sign is referring to, if you look closely, you'll see that there's an image of the Chaos Elemental on the sign. 
Thanks for watching everyone. Let me know if you want more useless information videos. I'd be happy to make them. And I hope everyone is doing well. Stay safe out there and I'll see you guys soon.